Is one a prime number? You might think you have an answer that's definitely correct, but what if I told you it wasn't so simple? It depends what you mean by a prime, what you mean by a number, and what you mean by one. Your modern understanding of these concepts may differ from historic standards. As we will learn, there are good reasons why one was considered to be a prime number, and also some good reasons why one wasn't considered to be a number at all. Why? And why did we converge on the collective understanding we have now that yes, one is a number, and no, it isn't prime? Or is there still a case for why one should be a prime number after all? Join me as we answer all of these questions and more on a journey through mathematical history. In this video, we're going to be discussing how numbers were conceptualized in three broad time periods, antiquity, the medieval period, and post-scientific revolution. It's like the world's most boring game of civilization, or if you're like me, the world's most somewhat interesting game of civilization. As always, when we're looking at history, it's important to remember that these ages and epochs have fuzzy boundaries. So naturally, I'll be simplifying things a little and depicting things in broad strokes. I'll leave a bunch of sources in the description if you want to get into the details yourself. So, antiquity. Where did mathematics begin? Well, nobody really knows. Hunter-gatherers were probably counting and doing basic arithmetic before the rise of civilization. Unfortunately for us, hunter-gatherers spent their time hunting and gathering instead of doing more important things, like thoroughly documenting their approach to mathematics. These primal humans in their numerical primacy might have included a concept of prime number in their primordial understanding, though no primary source of our primeval ancestors exists to verify as such. Anyway, many civilizations conceived of numbers in their own way and developed their own number systems, but the first documented systematic approach to mathematics as we know it came in ancient Greece. What did they have to say about numbers and primality? Well, the Greeks were known for their love of geometry and in some way thought of numbers as lengths. They also didn't consider one to be a number. Euclid in his Elements explicitly puts one into its own category, the monad what we think of as the unit or unity, a word for one that's still used today, like when we say roots of unity. And monad is still with us in all things mono, like monorail, monotonous, and so on. A number, he defined, is that which can be built of multiple monads, a collection of units. Now here's where the lengths come in. So six is a number because it's a collection of units. We would say something like six is divisible by two, but their concept of divisibility is referred to as measurement. So they say six can be measured by two. It can be built out of a bunch of twos. It can also be measured by three, but for example, it can't be measured by four. Now, Euclid defined a prime number as a number which can only be measured by the unit. So a number like seven is a prime number. It's a number because it's a collection of units and it's prime because it can't be measured by anything other than one. It's also worth noting that they didn't really consider self measurement to be a thing while we would consider seven as divisible by seven. When they say measured, they mean measured by a smaller number. So seven is a prime number, whereas a number like six, it can be measured by some other numbers. So it is not prime. Now, because a prime number was a class of numbers and one wasn't considered to be a number, generally one wasn't considered to be a prime, kind of by default. Now, many other thinkers, including Aristotle and Plato, conceived of numbers in the same way, but there wasn't total unanimity. Plato's nephew and successor, Speusippus, considered one to be a number, and therefore the first prime number, as it can only be measured by one. But broadly speaking, the consensus was the notion found in Euclid's Elements. Now, it's worth asking, why did they care about primes in the first place? Usually we only give names to things that are useful. Well, as far as I can see, these early mathematicians were interested in classification and in the provable properties of numbers. They were conducting a sort of taxonomy. They spoke of how numbers were formed from other numbers. This is where the term prime originates. Prime means first. A number like six, which isn't prime, isn't a first number because it is formed from numbers that precede it, like two and three, whereas a number like seven is in some way a first number. No earlier number can form seven. It is the first in the string of the multiples of seven. 
For this reason, some thinkers regarded odd numbers as more special than even numbers, because an even number can be formed from an odd number, but an odd number can never be formed from an even number. Martianus Capella writes in 400 CE, no number can divide these numbers into integers, so they are called prime, since they arise from no number and are not divisible into equal portions. Arising in themselves, they beget other numbers from themselves, since even numbers are begotten from odd numbers, but an odd number cannot be begotten from even numbers. Therefore, prime numbers must of necessity be regarded as beautiful. A man after my own heart. In a way, they were purists engaged in mathematical discovery for its own sake probably the kind of pedantic know-it-alls who thought themselves intellectually superior and viewed their work as possessing greater merit than that of all other pursuits. In other words, they were my kind of people. But unlike my kind of people, they were also interested in numerology, the mystical properties of numbers. As soon as you discard scientific rigor, you're no longer a mathematician. You're a numerologist. The Pythagoreans were obsessed with the idea that numbers described the nature of being. One was associated with the mind, or mind of God, two with thought, and four was associated with justice, since it was a balanced number, as it could be divided and divided again. Martianus, who regarded primes as beautiful out of necessity, also writes about the number three. The triad is the first odd number, and must be regarded as perfect. It is the first to admit of a beginning, a middle, and an end. The number three represents the fates, the sisterly graces, a certain virgin who, as they say, is the ruler of heaven and hell. Further indication of its perfection is that the number begets the perfect numbers six and nine. Why are six and nine also considered perfect? Citation needed. It goes on and on. There's a passage like this for all the numbers from one to nine, like he's telling us their horoscopes. And bear in mind, this is a chapter on arithmetic. I would proclaim that we left such ideas in the distant past but a quick search of Pythagorean numerology shows how the practice has been modernized, misinterpreted, and misappropriated. So due to their mysticism, it was important to know which numbers beget other numbers, and which numbers were first or prime, because it illustrated the intertwining of their philosophical concepts. For us, the idea of primes begetting other numbers is crucial, as we will return to later. Also in antiquity, it was common to separate numbers first into even and odd, and then odd into prime and composite. For this reason, the primes were sometimes considered a subset of the odd numbers, and as such, two, an even number, wasn't regarded as a prime. Isidore of Seville, said to be the last scholar of the ancient world, writes, The reckoning of numbers ought not to be despised. And on that point we certainly agree. But on classification, he writes, numbers are divided into even and odd numbers. Even numbers are subdivided into evenly even, evenly odd, and oddly even. Odd numbers are subdivided into these categories, the primary and simple, the secondary and compound, the tertiary and mean, which in a certain way is primary and non-compound, but in another way is secondary and compound. It's all quite confusing, because what he calls a simple number, that's a prime, a composite number is a composite number, but a mean number, this tertiary classification, that refers to numbers like 9 and 25. They are composite when compared to themselves, they have factors, but they are prime when compared to each other, because they have no factor in common, what we would call today co-prime. But anyway, he only considers odd numbers to be prime, so 2, as an even number, is not regarded as prime. Isidore wrote these words in his Etymologies, one of the first encyclopedias ever written and an attempt to document all knowledge. Mad respect. It was also instrumental in standardizing a lot of the punctuation marks that we still use today. So the ancient view was that one wasn't a number. Primes were a class of numbers, therefore one wasn't considered to be prime. Because sometimes the primes were a class of odd numbers, sometimes two wasn't considered to be prime but such classifications didn't last forever. Forward then. Many of the great advances in mathematics in the medieval period were carried out by Islamic scholars, including Al-Khwarizmi, whose seminal work Algebra is where we get the term algebra. The great leap was in thinking of numbers in generality, and Al-Khwarizmi gives a detailed formalization of equations as solvable by balancing. He continues in the Greek tradition of separating unity from the rest of the numbers, and as such, doesn't consider one to be a prime number. 
And that was, broadly speaking, how numbers were conceived for the next seven or eight hundred years. A notable exception was Flemish mathematician Simon Stavin, I'm told that's how you pronounce it, who wrote under the name Stavenus. He is often considered the first person to conceive of the notion of a real number. Before that, number systems were generally restricted to the integers and the rational numbers, but Stavenus considered all points on the real continuum to be a number, and as such, considered one to be a number. There is even a tone of frustration in his 1585 work on arithmetic, in which he angrily asserts that one is in fact a number. He even seemingly solves the problem syllogistically. Premise 1. The part is of the same matter as its whole. Premise 2. Unity is part of a multitude of unities. Conclusion. Hence unity is of the same matter as the multitude of unities. Who denies this behaves like one who denies that a piece of bread is bread. Stavenus, I love your style, but unfortunately the reasoning is unsound. The first premise that the part is of the same matter as the whole is not true. Water is wet, but a water molecule isn't. This is what we would call today a fallacy of division. But anyway, let's park the discussion on logic here and save it for my upcoming video on deductive reasoning. Maybe upcoming. He later gives another justification as to why 1 should be considered a number by saying 3 is a number, 2 is a number, the result of 3 subtract 2 should be considered a number as well. For me, these ideas herald the beginning of abstract algebra, the notion that sets should be closed under certain operations. Somewhere down the line, things were simplified, and primes weren't thought of as a subset of the odd numbers. The definition that a prime number is that which can only be measured by 1 stuck, so it became one to include two in the list of primes. Throughout the 15th and 16th centuries, you can see in writings lists of primes beginning two, three, five, seven, and so on. Though not all lists. A funny exception comes from Samuel Morland, a mathematician and inventor who pioneered the creation of mechanical calculators. He discusses primes in his 1673 work, <gasps> The description and use of two arithmetic instruments together with a short treatise explaining and demonstrating the ordinary operations of arithmetic. If I ever need a snappy title for a YouTube video, I'll look to his work. Anyway, he defines a prime number as that which can be measured only by a unit. That is to say, 2, 5, 7, 11, and so on. His omission of 3 is believed to have been an accident. And so it went, but following Stavenus, there is a sense of shifting perspective regarding one's status as a number. J. Moxon's first ever dictionary of mathematics defines a number as being a multitude of units, but also notes that to some, the omission of one itself as a number seems questionable. The first great listing of numbers by Branca and Pell was a table of all odd numbers less than 100,000, showing which are prime and which are composite, and their list begins with one as a prime. And when you think about it, if your definition of prime is a number which can only be measured by one, and you start to consider one to be a number, then surely it should be counted amongst the primes, as it fits the definition. Goldbach, of the famous Goldbach conjecture, wrote a letter to Euler discussing primes being represented as sums of primes. Here, he clearly uses one as a prime in his sums. Around this time, G.S. Kruger published a list of primes calculated by Peter Jaeger from 1 to 100,999. They include 1 as a prime. And so it sort of became the norm to include 1 as a prime number. But not everyone saw things this way. Euler himself, in his Elements of Algebra, gives the most modern account. Who else would it be but Euler? He says a number is prime when its only expressions as a product use one. Six is composite. It's not prime because it can be written as two times three. Two numbers, neither of which are one. Five is prime because its only products are forced to include one. And this is key. It might have been typical at the time, but this is the first text I could find that marked the shift from the additive measuring of numbers to the multiplicative construction of numbers that we understand today. The concepts are the same, but the framing is different. Opinions are still a bit mixed in writings, but from one intellectual giant to another, we turn our attention from Euler to, of course, Gauss. He provides the first known proof of what became known as the Fundamental Theorem of Arithmetic. 
this result forms the bedrock of our understanding of numbers today. It is that every integer can be written uniquely as a product of primes. You probably learned this in school. 60 is 2 times 2 times 3 times 5. We can derive this product of primes using a factor tree. There are many factor trees you can draw, but the final answer will always be the same. The existence of a prime factorization was proved much earlier, and it's pretty straightforward. If you have a number that isn't prime, that means you can write it as a product of two numbers, neither of which are one, and therefore both are strictly less than your original number. And then you can play the same game with each of these until you hit the primes. Since the numbers in your product are strictly less than the number above, the process must eventually terminate as the numbers are getting smaller each time. The fact that the product at the end is always the same is a bit more difficult to prove, but it provides every integer with its own unique signature. The phrase I'm about to use is a bit cliche, but it's true, so I'll say it. The primes are the building blocks of the integers. And it's at this stage, it's worth asking again, why do we care about primes? In antiquity, they were interested in classifying numbers and feeling out their properties. Three begets six and nine and 12 and 15. But our modern understanding is to consider the full decomposition of numbers into their prime factors. 6 is 2 times 3, 9 is 3 times 3, 12 is 2 squared times 3, 15 is 3 times 5, and so on. All integers can be broken into primes. Knowledge and understanding of integers will follow from knowledge and understanding of primes. Here we've reached the understanding that all integers are composed of a unique selection of primes. If we allowed one to be a prime, then some of the magic is lost with this fundamental theorem, because this now isn't the only product of primes that equals 60. So is this, and this, and so on. In stating the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, we'd have to qualify it by saying every integer can be written uniquely as a product of primes other than one. And that's true for so many modern results about primes. Let's look at another example. Euler's totient function, phi of n. This equals the amount of numbers less than n which don't share a factor with n. And it has a really satisfying formula. Let's look at an example. So the totient of 20, that's the amount of numbers less than 20 which don't share a factor with 20. So let's count them first. So how many numbers less than 20 don't share a factor with 20? Well, all the even numbers share a factor with 20, namely 2. And also 5 and 15 share a factor with 20, namely 5. So there are eight numbers left that don't share a factor with 20, so we say that 20 has a totient of eight. Now, there's a satisfying shortcut to calculate the totient of any number. So what you do is you first find the prime factorization of that number. So 20 is two squared times five. We're not worried about the powers, we just want to find the unique prime factors. So in this case, two and five. So then what we do is we plug them into this formula here. We do 20, and then we multiply it by one minus one over two, and then we multiply it by one minus one over five. If we were dealing with a number that had more unique prime factors, like 60 before also had three as a prime factor, we would also times by one minus one over three, and so on. So let's compute this. So this is 20 times a half times four fifths, which is 80 over 10, which is eight. And that is exactly the answer that we had up here when we counted them by hand. But this is a shortcut that will work for any number. Now, if one was a prime, then one would be a unique prime factor of 20. So for our formula to be consistent, we should be times in by one minus one over one. But one minus one over one is zero. So we're timesing by zero and the whole thing gets ruined. So in specifying the formula, we would have to say we times by one minus one over P for all primes other than one. And there's that phrase again, primes other than one. So many results would have to be stated in that way that the most convenient thing is just to exclude one by default. But it's not just for convenience. Another reason why we exclude one from the primes is that one's behavior doesn't really mirror that of the other primes. An elementary result about primes is that if a prime P div divides a product AB, then either P divides A or P divides B. There's no 
alternative. It has to divide one or the other if P is prime. So I'll give you an example. Three is a prime and it divides the product of four and six, 24. And we can deduce from this that either three divides four or three divides six. And of course, this is the one that is true. Yes, it's true for one as well, but it's trivially true for one because one is a factor of everything. One divides everything. So it doesn't say anything about the underlying structure of the integers like it does with the primes. I've mentioned this before, but we often think that there is a defined thing which we then learn has a bunch of properties. But actually, it's often the other way around. There are things out there that exist that have certain properties. They're interesting to us, so we make up a name to refer to them. We make the definition based on the properties. This even happens outside of mathematics. We learn of the word planet, and then we learn what properties a planet has. It's roughly spherical, it orbits the sun, and it has cleared its orbit. But actually, it's the other way. There are things out there that exist, and we want a way to refer to them. We don't want to include things like the sun or asteroids, because those things don't really have any of the qualities that make planets what they are. So we say that a thing which orbits the sun is roughly spherical and has cleared its orbit, that's what we call a planet. When we discovered that Pluto is in a sea of other objects, it was more appropriate to be thought of as a particularly large Kuiper Belt object rather than a particularly small planet. It's the properties that inform the definition. And that's the real message of the video. What is a prime? Well, which definition is most convenient? The ancient world had an understanding of numbers which meant it was most convenient to classify one as its own distinct object, and therefore not a prime. The medieval world began to solve one as a number, and therefore a prime number in an effort to maintain consistency. In our view, it's most appropriate to think of one as a number, but not a prime. But even since Gauss, this definition didn't see universal agreement. Some school textbooks listed one as prime while others didn't. In O. Gregory's hilariously named text, Mathematics for Practical Men, one is listed as a prime. But even some heavy hitters like LeBaig and Klein list one as prime in some texts. Some authors, like LeBaig and Art Cayley, in their later works begin to omit one as a prime perhaps indicating that convention was forming. A great case of this is in G.H. Hardy's absolute classic, A Course of Pure Mathematics. The first six editions list one as a prime, but beginning with the seventh edition, one is not listed as prime through to the tenth and final edition. And bear in mind the sixth edition was first published in 1933, more recent than you might think. The 20th and 21st centuries enjoy broader consensus that one should not be considered prime. The rise of abstract algebra probably helped, in which the concept of primality is generalized to any ring. And the rise of mathematics as a more common profession, as well as the increased emphasis on collaboration, probably created the need for some standardization. But even having said that, Carl Sagan in his 1985 novel Contact writes of an alien species transmitting primes. The list begins 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, etc. Although the argument could be made that since it's an alien species, their definition of prime does include 1. And as late as 2010, the Cliffs Notes for the FDCE standardized test lists one as a prime, that is a state mandated certification test for teachers in Florida. So who knows? If you want my opinion, the current most convenient definition of prime omits one. But if our understanding of integers significantly changes, or if it becomes burdensome to have to write let P be a prime or one at the start of every result, maybe one should be included amongst the primes once again. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you liked this one. It's a little bit different from my earlier videos, but as I mentioned at the end of my last video on defining every number, that was the fourth and final part in that series of building numbers up from that mathematical foundation. So from here on out, I want to explore other topics. Always focused on mathematics because Let's face it, mathematics is just my favorite thing ever. Uh, but some of them will be like this and more focused on history. So if you don't want to miss any of that good upcoming mathematical content, please make sure you are subscribed. 
a massive thank you to my Patreon supporters. You really are keeping this channel alive. Your support has been incredible. Without you, I probably would have made two videos and called it quits on my channel. So thank you so much for that. If you'd like to support me as well, you'll find my link in the description below. Please consider doing so, but if not, don't worry about it. Like and share the video, that will help me out as well. This has been another Proof Under Another Roof. Until next Prime.